Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Kennedy. I'm the president and CEO of the Canadian Aquaculture Industry Alliance. I'm really, really happy to uh, welcome you to this panel discussion today on the blue economy, Canadian, Nova Scotian, and international perspectives. I'm joined by some great panelists today, and uh, we're really excited to start the conversation. Just a few uh, housekeeping uh, discussion points uh, for you today. I'm going to go through a few slides to start the conversation, and then we'll get into the discussion. So just Zoom housekeeping. Uh, first point, all participants will have their audio and video turned off during the, the webinar. We can't see you in some ways, unfortunate, but uh, I guess it keeps things a little cleaner. Second, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to be monitoring that as your moderator today. So please ask questions throughout. I'll pick those up and we'll have a good discussion towards the end uh, with some of your questions. The Q&A will be monitored, as I said, uh, I'll, I'll be doing that and there will be others as well. So again, throughout the session, please do ask questions. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Farm Credit Canada, uh, one, our main sponsors, Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board. And then we have a number of other sponsors of this event and we'd like to thank them and recognize them as well. Join us for another webinar. Uh, so I think many of you will know this, uh, this was originally planned to be in person. Of course, it's moved to this Zoom platform. Um, so in the meantime, there are going to be, there's going to be this session, of course, and then the next session on March 22nd, same time. Um, and that's Atlantic time, seafood market trends going forward. So that should be a really um, exciting uh, panel as well. And then finally, finally, uh, we should be able to move to in-person uh, for the Nova Scotia Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture Ministers Conference, partnered with the Sea, sea Farmers Conference. Uh, I heard from Tom Smith with the Aquaculture Association this morning, and he said there are still a few booths uh, for, um, uh, for partners to join in. So please uh, contact uh, the organizers if you're interested in having, having a booth. Finally, I'm not going to give the biographies of all of our speakers today, but here uh, you see them and you see them uh, just on your screen. But um, myself, again, uh, President and CEO of the Canadian Aquaculture Industry Alliance. And then we're joined, uh, I think I'll, I'll start with Ambassador Fredriksen from the Norwegian Embassy uh, based in Ottawa. Rob Pascal, who's with uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So thanks, Rob, for joining. Christian Pasch from uh, Innovation Norway. Kendra McDonald, CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, and Paul Landsbergen, President of the Fisheries Council of Canada. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, the Deputy Minister of Nova Scotia for her welcome. So April Howe, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Tim. Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. So thrilled to be with all of you here today. Um, thank you for participating in this midwinter webinar. It's great to have you all join us in this virtual forum. We do look forward to hopefully um, an in-person gathering at our 2022 Ministers Conference in October uh, on the 12th and 13th of this year. We did think, however, an online sharing of ideas like this in the interim was a really good idea to do. I'm the new Deputy Minister um, for the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, uh, and I've been working hard to really try to absorb all of the information and learn about the issues and the opportunities uh, in front of this industry um, that, that we have. Sharing ideas and information in a forum like this is a great way to ensure that our industry continues to grow, it continues to improve economically and sustainably. That is key. It's a vital balance that we have to try to strike, one that Nova Scotia's new government takes very seriously. And in fact, uh, it has included that as part of its mandate when, it came to, when, it, when that um, government came into office. So the focus on the blue economy for this webinar is a theme that was chosen quite deliberately. 
We have an impressive lineup of, of presenters, as Tim has shared with you, from a great variety of organizations, representatives from industry, from our own federal government, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and from ocean sector development research organizations as far away as Norway. And we're thrilled to have Norway uh, join us and representatives from Norway join us uh, this afternoon. We're happy to have all of you join us on this topic of the blue economy. The idea of the blue economy is about the sustainable use of marine resources for economic growth while also protecting and promoting the health of our ocean waters. I'm looking forward to hearing from the different perspectives on this relative to Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is linked commercially, historically, and culturally with the blue economy. We have long been prospering from the marine resources of the waters off of our shores. It's becoming more important today when we look at the pressures to establish greater food security. The COVID pandemic really truly opened our eyes to food security vulnerabilities and it's been a really important lesson learned. So we need to better understand what is the blue economy, what it is locally and internationally and what it can do for the Nova Scotia industry and our ocean waters and how other parts of the world have really great setups and have set good examples that Nova Scotia could potentially follow. It's important for us to explore how Nova Scotia's fisheries, aquaculture and seafood sectors can participate in pursuing a blue economy strategy. As our minister will share with you, those sectors with help from our department have been performing well and even during this, the COVID times that we're all living in. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Minister Steve Craig was elected as a provincial member three years ago and came into office with the new government last August. Prior to serving provincially, he was an elected member of the Halifax Regional Municipal Council since 2012. That came after <laughs> he had retired from a 30 year telecommunications career in Halifax. He is making a habit of retiring. I'm hoping to maybe get him to stick around past his mandate um, with us this time around. But um, for the meantime, he is well ensconced in, in his position as, as minister. He has served on the boards of Destination Halifax, um, the World Trade Convention Center, Lake District Recreation Association, the Canadian Cancer Society, Kabagoi Community Health Center Foundation, and Halifax Regional Municipalities Board of Police Commissioners. In the last few months, Minister Craig and I have developed a really strong working relationship. We see eye to eye on many issues, and I've come to know him as fair with a balanced and pragmatic approach to decision making. It is my pleasure now to introduce you and have Minister Craig come and speak to you. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Deputy Health, for that extremely kind introduction. I do appreciate it. Well, good afternoon and uh, good morning, everybody, depending on where you are around the globe. Uh, so happy that you're taking the time to contribute to this webinar today. I'm especially pleased to have His Excellency John Friedrichsen Ambassador for the Kingdom of Norway joining us for today's call and panel. We hope today will be a good way to keep the pump prime, so to speak, as we await our big fall conference in the fall. It's, uh, it wasn't meant to be a fall conference, but certainly with COVID and the way the world is shaking up, uh, we had to do this and I'm so pleased to be here with you today. It is a good way to stay in touch and share ideas today. I did a lot of traveling this past fall to meet with processors and others in the industry to introduce myself and the deputy and to learn more about issues that matter to the industry. I am hopeful this opportunity will help along the same lines. We are focusing today on the concept of the blue economy. Perhaps the two most important aspects of the blue economy are commercial and environmental applications. As we seek to attain maximum capacity from a strong, healthy blue economy, we need to consider how well we are doing on both those fronts. Commercially or economically, our most recent numbers show that the seafood industry is doing well. 
despite COVID challenges, Nova Scotia seafood exports, exports rather, were $2 billion in 2020. Seafood, which was amazing to me when I was first elected and found out in this portfolio, is the largest export commodity from Nova Scotia. It represents 38% of the provincial total. Nova Scotia ships lobster, shrimp, snow crab, oyster, swordfish, and more to nearly 80 countries around the world. That's why our seafood industry makes Nova Scotia the leading seafood exporter in Canada. Our industry contributes 31% of the country's seafood exports. Nova Scotia's seafood processing sector employs about 5,500 people. And these figures speak volumes as to the importance of the blue economy to our province. Environmentally, we are also seeking to make good progress towards the healthy blue economy that we will all envision. For example, we are committed to a low impact, sustainable aquaculture industry, and we will work to ensure a licensing process that emphasizes environmental considerations. That is among the commitments and the mandate that Premier Houston assigned me as minister when I joined the department last August. It is why I have initiated a comprehensive review of the aquaculture regulations to make sure that there is appropriate consideration for the environment, the fishing industry, as well as other users of all our waters. Another example of environmental considerations and the implications within a blue economy is our mandate to create a classification system for aquaculture development. The system will rate coastal areas of the province on their suitability for fin fish aquaculture. It is one of the core recommendations of the 2014 Dole Lehi report. You know, it, that report was uh, previously commissioned by a, an administration back 2013 or so, and then the previous administration took it and ran with it and made changes to regulations. And now this administration is going to look at it and implement it as best we can. And also part of that implementation includes recognizing changes in the world and the global economy, how we do business and our regulations must also change with that. Our department is also working with the municipality of Argyle to establish an agriculture development area to proactively facilitate the sustainable development of shellfish and marine plant agriculture through a defined public process. The application process for sites within the ADA, agriculture development area, will require less time and effort from an applicant as the space has already been pre-approved for the activity. And this will be a significant benefit to the industry. The economic and sustainable growth of the industry relies on things such as innovation, infrastructure, and science partnerships. Fishing smarter, not harder, is the appropriate, pardon me, catchphrase. To achieve that, the 400 million Atlantic Fisheries Fund cost shared between the Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the remaining other three Atlantic provinces continues to help the seafood industry stay strong, prosperous, and sustainable. Our companies market their seafood is also significant. There's been a good uptake so far. Excuse me while I change my slide here. This is one of the things that I do not like is speaking from notes. However, it is important that I don't miss anything. So it appears as though, hang on here, yep. There has uh, been good uptake so far in the Nova Scotia Seafood Quality Program. The program promotes high quality standards within the Nova Scotia seafood supply chain and aims to enhance our global reputation for premium quality seafood under the Nova Scotia seafood brand. Certified companies receive a very and a variety of unique promotional benefits such as access to the Nova Scotia seafood brand creative marketing materials that we make readily available. I encourage you and all those who are doing business here in Nova Scotia to consider certifying and spreading the word in the industry. Labor, to, to help industry address labor gaps, the fisheries and aquaculture student bursary program is available for bursaries up to $1,500 towards education costs for students working in the sector. Approximately 180 bursaries have been awarded since their introduction a few years ago. I'm pleased to announce to you right now to tie the program more closely to industry 
we will be transforming the fisheries and aquaculture bursary program to the fisheries sector council. They will manage and promote this particular initiative and we will certainly be there to help them do that. A news release announced that change will be going out this afternoon. Finally, a word about climate change and the blue economy and the two are inextricably linked. As a government, we will work in partnership with the seafood industry on a strategy for climate change adaptation and mitigation. The objective is to reduce the sector's contribution to climate change. It is important our seafood industry actively assesses and reduces their energy use to save money and reduce emissions. Our on-site energy manager I announced in the fall is working to help industry achieve those goals. I wanna thank you for your attention. I, I hope your webinar experience is productive and useful for you today. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in person this fall and uh, the Minister's uh, Fisheries and Agriculture Conference. And also to, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this webinar. Thank you very much. And I suppose it's over to you now, back to our moderator, Tim Kennedy. Thanks, Mr. Craig. Uh, thank you for the, the good words and the, and the good action happening in Nova Scotia. Lots to accomplish. So what I'm gonna do right now is we're gonna start our, our presentations. I'm gonna dig into some slides uh, briefly just to, to give the context around the blue economy. So bear with me as I do that. Okay. So everyone should see that. Can I see a, a thumbs up from my panelists? Great. Okay. So what we're what what we're talking about in particular today is, of course, the seafood opportunity within the blue economy opportunity. So I think everyone on this call will know uh, Canada has such amazing biophysical capacity. Nova Scotia has amazing biophysical capacity for seafood development and blue economy uh, development as well. And so what we want to take you through is just a few slides. One second. There we go. Again, I'm, I'm guessing many on this, uh, on this webinar are going to know some of these numbers, but they're always really important to remind ourselves of and remind others of. So we know that 71, 72% of the earth is covered by, by oceans. Only 3% of human food comes from those oceans at the moment. In the meantime, the seafood sector is the fastest growing food sector in the world at seven to 10% growth per year. And by 2050, we're expected to have close to 10 billion people. So how do we feed these people sustainably? How do we feed the planet? How do we feed ourselves is a big question. Again, this will be familiar. The, the chart, this chart from the UN FAO just looks at projections for seafood demand and seafood supply. So right now, about just over 50%, about 55% of total seafood production is from aquaculture farm sources. And as you can see, going forward, the expectation is that wild will be flat uh, and aquaculture will increasingly fill, fill that delta with the demand. This is a slide that Kaya created, um, and it just gives you that perspective on that biophysical capacity for, in particular, aquaculture. And of course, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. And, and Paul, after me, will talk more about the wild capture side. But what this does is it gives you a picture of, in, of capacity. So this is shoreline capacity. It's a very simple measurement of that, of, of what we can, you know, what we have available to us. So in the US, about 20,000 kilometers of coastline available. And the US is producing in terms of intensity at about 10 tons per kilometer. Norway, and we'll hear shortly from the ambassador and from Christian, has about 25,000 kilometers um, of incredible fjords, uh, mostly, uh, and, and is producing at about just over 50 uh, uh, tons per kilometer. So a much higher intensity. Canada, and this does not include Arctic and Great Lakes waters, this is east west coast St. Lawrence area, about 80,000 kilometers of viable coastline for aquaculture, and we're producing at about two tons per kilometer, so incredibly low intensity. And even if we were to double our production in Canada uh, of, of aquaculture, you would not see a doubling of intensity because we're much more efficient in terms of our farming than we have been in the past. So Canada is a signatory to um, uh, an important initiative, uh, the High Level Panel for Sustainable Oceans Economy, 
And some of the research they've done is really, really important in terms of, of how we feed the world. We know that we can, uh, the ocean could, could actually produce six times more than it does now to, to feed humans. Um, we know that uh, you know, two thirds of the protein needed uh, could come from the oceans to feed, to feed uh, future populations. It is a top, the seafood sector is a top contributor to the ocean economy. So this is a, a measurement for international, international, but it would be similar to Canada. We know that DFO's work also looks at how, uh, you know, how much employment there is and seafood is really at the center of that employment picture uh, in Canada. We also know from a climate perspective that eating more seafood is good for the planet. So we know that uh, from a carbon profile perspective, if we were to eat and, and consume, uh, produce more seafood, we would actually have a beneficial impact on, on climate change. And the benefits from a financial investment perspective are significant. This is also from the high level panel. So every $1 invested uh, in, in sustainable seafood development yields $10 in benefits, health benefits, environmental benefits, and economic benefits. This is all from the high, level, uh, high levels work in the last two years. I want to just talk about the picture for Canada. So where we are is, uh, you know, we, we certainly are a strong producer. At one time, we were the largest exporter of seafood in the world many years ago. We are no longer, uh, we are no longer in that place. And we are increasingly focused on quality of production, which is a good thing. And Paul will talk a little bit more about that in terms of the vision for seafood development in Canada. We know the last two, two years have been, have been difficult. But of course, Nova Scotia in the Canadian picture is a really significant leader in uh, seafood production, both from the wild capture perspective and increasingly from the aquaculture perspective. I think it's really important for us to understand what, what are Canadians and North Americans eating? This picture is consistent between Canada and the US, but there are really two major species that are consumed. And, and that is uh, salmon at number one and shrimp at number two. All other choices are actually in the single digits. And people often don't understand that. And from a salmon perspective, what we saw uh, for COVID during the COVID period is a spike in consumer demand specifically for fresh salmon from the grocery store and that's really all farm raised so most of this consumption of salmon is farm raised which is really important for canada i talked about the carbon impacts and we did some calculations based on uh based on a calculator that the world wildlife fund has right now canadians seafood is actually a very small component of the diet it's 1.6 percent of the canadian diet is seafood on average if we were to just double that, and that's been something discussed for quite a while, but if we were to double that, you'd see actually a, a reduction in, in carbon emissions of up to three megatons or the equivalent of about 650,000 cars off of Canadian roads. So really, really, again, very significant in terms of the potential for seafood to meet numerous goals. I'm gonna end on this slide, a little bit of a sobering slide. Uh, the question is, are we realizing our blue economy potential in Canada? And I just compare, we have uh, Norway and Norwegian speakers here today, but I'm gonna compare Canada's production to Norway. Canada has basically flatlined in aquaculture production for 20 years. We have this amazing biophysical capacity in the country, but we've actually flatlined and in some ways declined. At the same time, Norway may have started a little bit earlier than us and we're really the, I think the originators of salmon farming at a commercial scale but we weren't too far behind at the very beginning. And Norway has really embraced the opportunity. They now produce 10 times, approximately 10 times what Canada produces. And they've also made a commitment, and we hope to hear more about this, to expand the value of their seafood sector by five times by 2050. And I will say in Canada, a huge, I think a major challenge is that we don't have a vision for the seafood sector to grow the sector. We don't have a vision for the aquaculture sector and this is really missing. And I think the Norwegians have done an amazing job in sort of capturing that. There is a dotted line on the Canadian red line, which you'll see. And there have been some decisions taken in the last couple of years in regards to salmon farming, especially on the West Coast, which will impact, I think, blue economy realization. And the question is, do we wanna to continue to decline or can we finally break through and really be a leader in Canada, in, in the world for aquaculture and seafood development? So with that, I'm gonna leave you, uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen 
And I'm going to turn it over to Paul Landsbergen, President of the Fisheries Council of Canada, for his presentation. Paul, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you, Minister Craig, for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm going to share my screen as well, because uh, I have a slide deck that's going to follow um, much of what uh, Tim talked about. So Tim covered many aspects of the you know, opportunity we have in Canadian seafood. A strong rationale to realize this opportunity. And our two associations representing the wild capture and aquaculture came together to develop a joint vision as part of the blue economy strategy dialogue. And so I wanna cover a, a few aspects of it um, that, uh, that Tim you know, focused on a lot of the rationale behind it, but uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in the, in the domestic context as well. So first we should look at uh, the federal mandate. Uh, Minister Joyce Murray uh, was given a mandate letter, much like all of her cabinet colleagues, from the Prime Minister. And here's a few quotes that I pulled out. Um, so the Minister is supposed to work to support sustain sustainable, which I would argue we are very sustainable in our seafood sector. Um, we're not perfect, but we're better than uh, many other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, and we certainly have a stable uh, sector in how we operate. Prosperous, well, there's always room for improvement there. And I wanted to highlight, uh, certainly that's a key part of uh, the minister's mandate is to support a prosperous uh, fisheries. And Canada's fisheries can continue to grow uh, the economy and sustain coastal communities. We're, we, we are the lifeblood of hundreds of coastal communities in Atlantic Canada, in BC, and even up in the north. The next quote is interesting because the minister is mandated to continue working with business. And I wanna highlight the fact that business is listed first because quite frankly, since the liberal government was elected in 2015, um, I think many people in the business sector across a whole host of sectors uh, really don't think that the liberal government has been that friendly to business in many of its decisions. And uh, so the fact that business shows up as a first uh, stakeholder group in this, I think is quite noteworthy. And in addition to working with a number of other partners, uh, the intent is for long-term sustainable growth of our fish and seafood sector. And long-term sustainable growth is paramount. Um, not acting responsibly in how we operate would only jeopardize not only our future prosperity, but also our viability. And so we take that uh, very seriously. There are many other elements to the minister's mandate that could run counter or represent potential trade-offs with the blue economy uh, growth in volume and value. And so um, there's uh, more that could be discussed there, but I did want to highlight that, you know, it's, uh, and important to find the balance. Much of uh, the sector, I think, would agree that DFO sees itself too much as only a regulator. You know, when we compare perhaps uh, DFO to agriculture uh, department, uh, they see themselves much more to promote Canadian ag agriculture. And uh, so when DFO looks at only protecting the ocean, rather than allowing for sustainable use, protection without that sustainable use, I would argue is not sustainable and it's certainly not prosperous. So how can we do both at the same time? And the sector has too much policy uncertainty. So frequent surprise decisions uh, without consultation can really disrupt uh, business planning, can certainly chill investment for future growth and can create uh, stagnant uh, operations and sector and certainly not enable us to realize our full potential. But as Minister Craig uh, alluded to, it's not just the role of one level of government to work with industry and other stakeholders to 
uh, make sure that our oceans are sustainable, but also uh, facilitate us in maximizing our economic benefits from that uh, Uh, sort of quotes from the Nova Scotia government. So Minister Craig, you, know, you want to highlight areas of focus and promote greater collaboration and coordination with your provincial counterparts and the federal government. And uh, we would certainly like to see that as well. Consistent decision-making to encourage business and investor confidence. You talked about in the need for innovation and investment. And that's certainly a key part of how we're going to realize more value from our resources. So overall, uh, we have not seized the opportunity in Canada as uh, Tim showed in comparisons to foreign jurisdictions uh, such as Norway. And so we'd like to see us do better. And as I said at the beginning, uh, our two associations, uh, FCC and CAIA came together to partner to create a vision and action plan for securing our blue economy potential. And we released uh, this vision last year ahead of the federal consultations. Uh, we've had countless conversations with the department, with the political level and uh, parliamentarians as well as uh, provinces as well. And we've received good uh, reception to our ideas. So what's our vision? Our vision is first and foremost, we're looking out 20 years, not just five or 10. It takes time to really be transformative. And we see ourselves as being among the top three global best sustainable fish and seafood producers. This is not meaning that we're gonna be the largest in volume. Um, that ship has sailed uh, many moons ago, but we wanna be in the top three for best quality and best sustainable practices. And we think uh, we can get there. If we succeed in achieving that vision, then there's three main benefits uh, to Canada. We think we can double the value of Canadian seafood. We can double the economic benefits uh, to Canada and we can double domestic consumption of fish and seafood. Tim showed uh, the, the little uh, factoid about uh, how little uh, seafood makes up our Canadian diet. And we're not eating you know, the recommended levels and 70% of what we eat of fish and seafood is actually imported. So there's lots of opportunity to grow the domestic consumption. And in terms of value, I wanna emphasize that certainly on the wild capture side, we don't see ourselves growing in volume uh, significantly. It's really about value. How do we generate more value from what we harvest? On the aquaculture side, uh, certainly growing in value, but also um, Tim talked about the aspirates growing volume. We have so much uh, physical potential there. Just looking at, uh, this is one slide I borrowed from Nova Scotia, uh, looking at uh, the GDP uh, breakdown across the provinces of our commercial fisheries and our exports. So you can clearly see that Nova Scotia uh, is the largest. And so when we talk about doubling uh, the economic benefits, uh, if we have 9 billion in annual GDP across uh, seafood, then we could double that to 18 billion. And certainly Nova Scotia at 850 million, this might actually be a little dated, uh, could see much more than that. And who needs to be part of this dialogue? Um, you'll hear from Kendra talk about the ocean supercluster, and there really is a full ecosystem of business across different uh, sectors that can contribute to the growth. And this is a slide from, uh, I borrowed from Nova Scotia on their ocean cluster, and you can just see all the logos, how expansive this is, and the support of other organizations around the perimeter of this uh, image. And so we all need to work together in a collaborative and coordinated fashion. And uh, I will leave it there and I look forward to the uh, conversation we're about to have. Great, thanks Thank Paul. Uh, just, uh, we're running a little bit behind. So um, 
I'm going to turn it quickly to Kendra McDonald. Many of you will know Kendra, CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster. Kendra, thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity to, um, to join you again today. I, I feel Tim and the ambassador like we're on a bit of a tour um, last time in person in November. So it's great to see you again. Uh, let me just share my slides here. Hopefully that works. Uh, again, okay. So I thought I'd just spend a, a couple of minutes. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with the Ocean Supercluster, and just uh, dive into a few of the projects that we now have really focused uh, in the seafood space. So we are one of five superclusters in Canada. So the supercluster program overall, uh, we have projects from coast to coast, almost two billion dollars in terms of the overall portfolio value across the superclusters. There are over seven thousand members across the supercluster family. And almost 2,000 of those are collaborating on projects. So I think when we look at seafood, certainly the ocean supercluster has a concentration of projects focused on ocean, maybe no surprise, but there is an illegal fishing project, for example, that is part of the digital supercluster and proteins that is focused on plant-based solutions. They are actually looking at plant-based solutions for uh, fish feed as an example, as, as part of aquaculture. So we are cross-sectoral. Um, so that makes us a bit unique in terms of other blue economy investments in Canada. We have members from across aquaculture, fisheries, you know, offshore resources, bioresources, transport, defense, ocean technology. And we are really working to get those organizations to collaborate together to solve some common challenges. And so we've seen that as effective. So we've got projects that are sort of focused on a single industry, but we have multiple projects that are building solutions that scale to more than one sector at the same time. What we are really trying to do when we say we're changing the way ocean business is done in Canada is we are looking to build an ocean economy that is more firstly collaborative. And so why is that important? Especially when we talk to companies, for example, in the fishery, it allows smaller investments to be able to achieve outcomes because you're working with other companies. And so we've already heard today the importance of building a seafood sector that is more sustainable, also more productive. So the more that we can introduce technology, the more that we can reduce waste, we're able to get more output from the same input. And that is incredibly important for the, for the future of the sector. So being able to do that together and finding ways, you know, co-opetition, co finding ways where we can solve certain uh, challenges together allows those investments to go farther than a company uh, trying to work on its own. Also developing solutions that are digital. So lots of technology investments, lots of data collection, uh, for example, focused on precision fishing, better use of overall ocean resources, uh, um, solutions that are, that are increasingly sustainable. So reducing emissions, for example, or improving practices. We're also trying to build an inclusive workforce. So one of the challenges that we hear in terms of traditional sectors, like the fishery, for example, is finding the workforce of the, of the future, bringing those digital solutions to, um, to, the, to the sector is increasingly challenging. So how do, we, how do we do that? And then you heard, I think the speakers before me talked about world leading, what type of role we wanna have in the world going forward. So um, we have lots of different projects. What I thought I'd do is spend a bit of time, I think. So we now have a portfolio of over 60 projects, over $350 million in project value. So a few of those to highlight, um, so I don't want to drive us further behind um, schedule, but we have several in the uncrewed vessel space. And so these vessels, whether they are on water or they are underwater, they have different sensors and they're trying to capture different information. And so whether that is tracking, uh, whether that is environmental monitoring, um, but really it's they all have different purposes around collecting data and trying to be able to make better decisions. And so we also have a number increasingly that are focused on emission reduction. And so that's really, a lot of that is focused on fleet or maritime transport, um, but we're seeing some of that being tested in, in the fishery, for example. And so we have uh, several in the alternative fuel space. We just uh, announced a big project that is focused on biofuels. We have one which is transitionary fuel. And we have another one which you may be familiar with being led out of Nova Scotia, with it, which is being led by GIT. And that is in the coatings space. So they have actually just proven out through a project with Transport Canada 
on a smaller vessel, a 20% emission reduction, and they are working with us to be able to test that on a larger vessel. Out on the West Coast, we have a project that is uh, focused on electrification, so trying to get bigger batteries onto larger vessels to be able to go further. So a few of our newer projects, which you may be less uh, familiar with. So, um, and these are all sort of tackling different challenges. So Talibot, for example, has been around for a while. It's in the fish processing space, trying to bring artificial intelligence to be able to improve yield. Deep Trucker, which was recently announced. So it's in the underwater robotics space and they are actually looking at cage inspection, being able to use robots within the nets <laughs> to be able to identify issues and leveraging uh, technology to be able to do that analysis. We've got ASL set on the West Coast and they are looking at aeration and again, being able to improve overall health within aquaculture. Catchy is uh, looking at precision harvesting. So they're actually with the net technology <coughs> to be able to improve making sure you're catching the right thing and doing it in the least harmful way possible. Assured is a rope on command technology and that's really to be able to reduce the risk to species in terms of being get, getting caught in the nets. We have some of our bigger projects. Uh, so integrated operations rig that's being led out of Marystown looking at real time aquaculture and that's with subsea imaging as well as um, uh, tracking fish tracking. And so we also have our ocean startup project, which I thought was worth mentioning. So we just awarded 40 uh, startups with various levels of funding. And I just took a quick look, over a quarter of those are developing some kind of solution that is relevant to the seafood sector, either in terms of fishery, fish, fish, um, the well fishery and fish tracking traceability, or in terms of improving practices within, um, within the aquaculture sector. And then I talked about as well that that building of workforce. And so we see this as incredibly important to make sure that we've got the diversity of thinking that we are bringing to the challenges. And I think, you know, we are we talked about climate change. This is a very motivating space for workers to be in, but in a lot of cases, they don't know it. So when they think about, um, the ocean sectors, I think about marine science, they're not necessarily thinking about automation or blockchain or um, you know, remote monitoring, artificial intelligence, a number of the technologies that we're actually bringing to these sectors to be able to improve productivity, as well as to be able to increase sustainability. And so I think it's incredibly important and this is a great discussion around you know, aquaculture as a sustainable source of seafood. We need to continue to be able to demonstrate sustainability and be able to improve social license, but it is an incredible opportunity and it is highly relevant to the conversation around food security. So I think I gave you a couple of minutes back, Tim. So there you go. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kendra. And and yeah, it's it's great to be uh, great to be on a bit of a tour together. Um, I'm going to invite now our Norwegian representatives, uh, Ambassador Fredriksen first, followed by Christian. So we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, Tim, Kendra, um, Paul, uh, thank you for, for uh, having me this, uh, this morning. Um, I'm honored to be on this uh, panel today and uh, to take part in this event. Obviously, um, I would have loved to, to uh, join you all in, in person in Nova Scotia. And hopefully uh, we can do that soon. Um, I hope I can be able to, to come out and see you guys in Nova Scotia in, in a month's time or so. And, and obviously also the embassy will be uh, present um, for the event in, in, in the fall. Now, uh, a lot has been said already uh, about uh, the development and the future of, of uh, aquaculture uh, and seafood production, uh, both in Canada and there has been uh, hints uh, about what's going on in, in Norway. So um, I would, um, I'm going to say a few words about that and then also turn over to, to my colleague from Innovation Norway. Uh, we're starting with this uh, slide from, um, from the UN, from the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And the reason for that is, of course, that if we are to reach any of those goals that uh, Tim mentioned to transfer from, from, from a world where we have 3% um, 
of of the world's food coming from the oceans uh, to a world where that would be like 66 percent or something we have to do it within these uh, sustainable goals and that's what the uh, high level ocean panel where both our prime ministers uh, sit that's what this panel is, is is all about it's about sustainable production uh it's also about protection but primarily it's about sustainable uh production uh, we do uh, know the un knows that we have to increase uh food production uh in the ocean and uh on the panel it's not just a a club that you join it's it's a a, a commitment and all the the panel members and the panel member countries have to work out as we will hear about later uh, also from from canada um uh, comprehensive um, plans for managing uh, their uh, their oceans and that's part of the the uh, the point so to bring uh, countries and, and people together to show that it's actually uh, to show to others that are not members of the panel that it's actually possible to to do this uh, kind of comprehensive uh, uh, planning and and uh, to um, in that uh, in that way develop the the production of, of seafood um, France and the US uh, recently joined the panel so uh, President Macron of France just a few weeks ago and uh, uh, the US joined just before Christmas uh, I think it will be a high representative carry that that will be joining the panel uh, which is good uh, it means that we'll have another two uh, really big ocean nations coming in and and uh, putting their weight behind uh, the the message of, of uh, sustainable seafood production uh, of course the panel goes broader it's also about other kind of, of, of uh, ocean based um, uh, businesses uh, we're not going to go into that today but I just want to mention this because this is the framework for everything that's happening in Norway as well. Uh, uh, when we uh, have a goal, as was mentioned by Tim, to, to increase uh, the production of seafood uh, uh, to, uh, towards 2050, it's not just about you know, going all in and, and uh, increasing the production uh, uh, without looking uh, uh, either to the left or to the right. To the contrary, it's all about increasing that production within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. So the Norwegian government has uh, four uh, goals for, for the period to come. And that is which four goals that we have to fulfill if we are to increase production and, and uh, in increase the sector of aquaculture. And it is to be able uh, to sustain uh, uh, good health uh, for the for the uh, for the fish stocks uh, and animal welfare. It's about producing a sustainable uh, seafood with a very very low uh, climate footprint. It's about producing uh, uh, safe seafood, which is also capable of covering uh, the nutrition uh, needs uh, in the markets and, and in the world at large. And it's about having good access to the markets where our products can compete. And it's about being able to document that the Norwegian seafood that is exported or produced in other countries actually uh, meets those demands for food safety that will be more and more uh, uh, dominant in, in the future to come. And the fifth goal, which I think is extremely important to underline, is that we want to create good jobs and uh, valuable jobs uh, and also have uh, that will have lo effects locally on the local communities where all of these facilities uh, are located along the coast and that will bring uh, also incomes to to the communities now I, I i can't even start to think about what the norwegian coast would look like today if we didn't have the uh, immense increase in aquaculture that we have seen through the last decades um wild catch in norway uh has increased enormously through the through the same decades but the number of people who are engaged in actually uh wild catch fishing has gone down um so it's the technical technolo technological development uh so aquaculture has developed in parallel and made sure that we still have sustainable jobs along all the Norwegian coast. And that's a, also what the Norwegian companies are doing when they're investing in aquaculture abroad. 
in Chile, in Canada, Scotland, or, or, or in other places. They're investing in local communities because you need to have these facilities uh, uh, in areas uh, often that are not very densely populated, but we can create uh, local, local jobs. And that in turn brings me to, to a very important point, um, which is if you are going to go in and do that kind of, of, of investment, you will also need predictability. And working in the Canadian market, I think for, for Norwegian sea uh, aquacultural companies, uh, there are some challenges uh, linked primarily to, to the uh, dynamics, uh, if, if that's the right word, between provinces and on the federal level. Uh, it can sometimes be, be uh, challenging to navigate that. But also that in, at the end of the day, when, when, when some of those companies come into to, to, uh, Canadian market, they will look at it as, as one market. So if you're going to convince your shareholders to do a huge investment, say in Nova Scotia, you might see that, oh, we have a very good regulatory framework. We have full support from, from, from the provincial government. But at the same time, uh, there might be some challenges in, in another province where you want to invest as well. So it's difficult for, 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 uh, for the companies not to look at Canada as a whole. Um, and that's just a point I, I, I want to make so uh, that decision makers can, can take that point with them. So uh, before my time is up, let's move quickly to uh, go back to the first slide, just some fact and figures uh, here. Um, you can see them for yourself. I'm not going to read from, from the slide as such, but there is a total value creation in the Norwegian civil industry in 2020, 60 billion Norwegian uh, kroner, and that would be about 10 billion Canadian dollars, I believe. And you have a spin-off effect, which is uh, uh, calculated to be about 112 Norwegian billion kroner. Total exports of seafood in 2021, 120 billion Norwegian uh, krona, which is, you know, the second biggest after oil and gas in Norway. And that, that's uh, as simple as that. And 70% by now is salmon. But if we, as we will learn later, uh, other species are also being developed. And, and um, salmon, uh, I think, in the future will be a huge part of it. But there will be others as well. Uh, we uh, have a total value chain uh, for aquaculture from top to bottom. Uh, and as I said, it's the second biggest industry we have in our country and second, second biggest export. Next slide, please. So um, ambitions, uh, Tim already mentioned some of those ambitions on, on our behalf. Uh, scenario 2010 was potential in the marine industry with five times from uh, a value of 100 billion Norwegian kroners to 500 a billion Norwegian krona in 2050. As I said, there are a lot of conditions on that, but that's the goal. Uh, we know that the petroleum sector in Norway will decrease and uh, the seafood industry will be a more and more important part of our economy in the future, as it has always, uh, always been. Um, aquaculture is an environmental friendly way to produce proteins. Uh, it's not always portrayed that way, but it is. Uh, and obviously, there has been a lot of issues, and there still is, that we have to solve. Um, environmental impact on, on wild salmon is, is one, uh, and it's being addressed, and it's something that the industry has to address uh, constantly. Uh, animal welfare, I already mentioned earlier. Um, and there are two limited resources, which is feed ingredients. And to develop, to, to develop new feed ingredients uh, is extremely uh, important to also uh, take the technology further in, in the future. Access to sea area was also mentioned by Tim. Canada has that in abundance. Uh, Norway has used more of its coast already for this, but it is uh, becoming, I think also internationally, more and more challenging to find new places to produce, uh, uh, produce uh, fish and, and seafood in an eco uh, safe environment. Next slide, please. So development, as we say, in Norwegian goes in many different directions. Um, for Norway, it's, it's a, of course an overarching uh, priority to, to green the economy as a whole. And for us to green the economy means also to, to, to green the, the agricultural sector. There's no doubt about it. So it's all about taking to technology that has been developed in many different industries, including oil and gas, and use that techno technological know-how uh, to uh, develop green industries in the future. 
Uh, offshore wind is, is one big issue in Norway, but aquaculture also benefits from that technology, technological development that has actually come out of, of fossil fuel production. So, uh, and, and that's sort of the whole idea of, of uh, greening the Norwegian economy. Um, uh, for now, if you look at the agricultural sector, we do have uh, the backbone is, is uh, traditional cages, and uh, they will be with us for a long, long time. Uh, it is effective, and, and it is also environmentally friendly uh, and when in the summer production. Um, we see that in addition, it will be a more semi-closed solution in sheltered areas. I think that's also something that will be coming uh, with Norwegian companies to, to Canada uh, to... Um, to raise some of the fish for a longer time uh, on shore before it goes into to the sea as well. Um, exposed agricultural plants will make it possible to go offshore. And we also have several land-based farms developing in Norway. Offshore is just starting up, but it is coming as well, uh, as far as I can gather from our uh, uh, fisheries authorities back home in Norway. New technology platforms, uh, also to make small grow larger before it's put into the sea, is, uh, I think, a very important part of the, the development that we're seeing. Um, digitalization, use of big data and advanced computer technology are already contributing to um, improvements in production. And as in all other industries, this is something that's here to stay and that will become more and more important also. So in the future, uh, when we develop this industry in, in Norway. So giving you this very quick overview, giving some uh, political inputs from my side, uh, I would like to turn it over to Innovation Norway uh, and to uh, go more into what we are doing to um, promote uh, this industry abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, just a few words on Innovation Norway. Innovation Norway is a development uh, instrument, 50-50% owned by uh, the Ministry of Fisheries and Trade and uh, regional authorities. So we uh, have lots of different schemes to help uh, uh, Norwegian businesses doing uh, in, in innovation. Uh, and uh, as part of what we do, we have, um, a cluster program and I will now I will spend some time showing you how we use clusters to solve some of the issues within the aquaculture and how we use clusters to help the industry grow. So let me just see here I'm just going to close this one no I'm back. Hmm. Okay. So before I go into to how we use the clusters, I would just like to elaborate a little bit on what a Norwegian cluster is or what a Norwegian cluster supported by Innovation Norway is. Because um, we are a bottom up initiatives when it comes to clusters. It means that at the core of the clusters, there are businesses that wants to do things together. They want to solve issues working together. And that, that is at the core of the cluster. So there's no cluster in Norway coming from the, the top, it's always coming from the bottom, from the industry itself. So the cluster is, is owned and run by the industry. And uh, the industry, uh, uh, the businesses are at the core, but they also have to invite academica uh, and, and uh, startups and investors and also public um, uh, actors to, to join the cluster. But it's very important for us that the, it, it is the businesses that are at the core of the cluster. And uh, the partners will select a board of directors and the board of directors will be mainly from the businesses that could be academica in the in the board in the board as well, but they will never be in the lead it's always the businesses that needs to be in the lead of the Norwegian clusters. And the board of directors will set the ambition for the clusters, they will uh, point out the strategy, but more most important or, uh, at all, they will secure. Uh, the resources coming from the partners, because all the activities going on in the clusters has to be performed by the partners. Uh, the board of directors will also select the cluster administration. In Norway, it's lean and small. They will be responsible for uh, carrying or, or administering the, the different uh, activities going in, uh, on in the clusters. The clusters uh, in Norway are expected to, to contribute to transformation, green transformation and, and digital transformation. And they're also expected to have growth ambitions. 
And if you look at the, at the activities going on in the clusters, it's mainly competence and innovation uh, activities going on. So that's a bit, bit of the background for the Norwegian uh, cluster program. We support um, the cluster administration and we support also some of the competence and innovation activities going on. But it's a public a private um, private um, cooperation. So for every dollar we put in the cluster, the, the core uh, businesses also needs to put another put the same amount into the into the, the cluster. So it's a it's a public private uh, thing going on in the clusters. So moving on, uh, I think we all talked about the different challenges that lies within the aquaculture. They have great uh, growth plans, but they have some obstacles that they need to kind of um, find out. It's it's all about uh, you said it um, uh, already. It's about sustainable and economical uh, economical production. How can we increase? Because the market is there, the need is there, the world need. Uh, the blue uh, ocean to also provide us with more proteins moving forward. But how can we do this in a sustainable way? We have three clusters within uh, aquaculture. We have the NCC for innovation cluster. It's located in Bergen. Uh, the core of the clusters are the big producers. Uh, and they are mainly focusing on, on, the, on the, pins, uh, the pens and nets. And how can they make them even more sustainable? How can they make them even more economical moving forward? That's the main thing. And they have to, they, as, as um, was mentioned by the Mr. Ambassador as well, there are challenges uh, within the coastline. We are quite danced when it comes to, to pans and nets along the, the coastline. So there's a lot of uh, uh, issues that we need to, to handle uh, in that respect. Then we have the ANSI Aquatech cluster located in Trondheim. Trondheim is our technical, um, I would say technical center, uh, uh, capital, uh, uh, technical uh, capital with a technical school. And this is where the suppliers are gathering. How can they uh, constantly improve uh, all the different um, equipment that are, are supporting our uh, internationally also the, the aquaculture? And then we have the last one. This is, uh, this is the cluster called STEAM, which is a really interesting cluster. It's located in Stavanger. Stavanger is our oil and gas industry. And here we have a, a gathering of uh, oil and gas suppliers uh, together with the smaller producers. And they would like to, to kind of look at new ways of, of uh, doing aquaculture. So they are more on a destructive uh, way moving forward. And they use uh, the engineers and, and all the know-how we have for more than 30 years uh, operating in the, in the North Sea. So they are moving, they are the ones who are being most actively moving uh, production offshore. So uh, I will also just briefly, I know we are running out of time here, but I'll just briefly show you a little bit of what they are doing in the clusters. This is uh, one of the uh, projects run by ANSE Seafood Innovation. They have created uh, a cloud, an aqua cloud. All the producers in Norway now are, are sending their in information from sensors and, and other equipment in the cages to a common a shared um, aqua cloud or data cloud. Uh, this makes it much more efficient to report to the government on, on different issues. So there's an efficiency um, uh, premier in, in having this aqua cloud up and running. And they are also, uh, now that, that they are given access to a uh, accumulated uh, number of data from all the producers, they have a broader data set that they can actually do research and, and, uh, and uh, innovation on. Uh, and they also use it actively uh, to, to be more proactive when there are issues coming like algae or, or something like things like that, where they can actually predict uh, and do things in, in a proactive way to take better care of the, the fish and the fish health. So it's, it's a really good uh, example. And, and uh, another thing that came out of this aqua cloud was that this actually became a magnet for young people all over the world who would like to come to Bergen to use this data storage 
to create new solutions using artificial intelligence, using you know different um, uh, technologies uh, on top of this uh, data as a, as, a, as a resource. So we have uh, people coming from all over the world to Bergen to actually uh, use this cloud uh, as a resource for, for, for their businesses. And that is also, of course, uh, contributing to, to the Norwegian uh, businesses. Let's have a brief look at STEAM just very quickly. Um, STEAM is uh, using a lot of subsea, a lot of uh, different uh, uh, competence and knowledge from the oil sector, finding new ways to uh, produce salmon, uh, moving uh, the cages more offshore. Uh, the first uh, project here is actually they're actually looking at the whole value chain and seeing how can we make it greener and how can we make it more economical? Because lots of the, the new initiatives that are uh, being brought to the, to the market is still a bit expensive. So the first uh, project here is called Green Platform, where they're actually looking at tweaking and using the mindset of the uh, oil and gas industry to also see how can we reduce costs in, in uh, presenting these new technologies to, to or new ways of, of producing salmon to the market. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, uh, cluster to, to follow. And then we have the Aquatech cluster. They are, all the suppliers are in there with, uh, with all the solutions that has been tried out in Norway and it's also been tried out elsewhere in the world. They run lots of, um, promoting um, programs, internationalization programs, and moving uh, the Norwegian uh, industry out internationally. They don't promote each and every company, but they promote the overall um, industry perspective. Uh, and they are both looking for uh, commercial opportunities, but also co opportunities for collaboration on a research and, and innovation level. So this is uh, mainly what this, this cluster is all about in addition to, of course, the technology that they, they work with. And then the question is, does it work? Does clusters work? And, and uh, I, I think uh, Kendra will agree with me that measuring clusters are, is not very easy, but we do it in a way where we, we, have, uh, we take uh, all the uh, businesses within the clusters and we find similar businesses without the, that is not part of the cluster. And then we measure the value creation. And we see that the, 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 cluster, the, the businesses within clusters they have 15.7% higher value creation than uh, businesses without the clusters. So that's, that's a uh, pretty good uh, um, way of showing that uh, working together on issues creates value for all the, all the businesses within the cluster. And we also follow this number and we see that it stays above uh, uh, businesses within clusters stays above uh, businesses without the uh, outside clusters for uh, years to come. And that means that uh, we don't have all the money that uh, Canada is spending on, on uh, clusters, but we, um, we have about uh, $15 million US dollars uh, uh, every year that we put into clusters. And looking at these numbers, it means that there's a payback time for two to three years. Uh, so it's 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 really effect effective to use this. Uh... Last slide, I would just like to introduce you to Lori because uh, Lori, together with the embassy, is part of Team Norway, and she's working in Canada, and she is uh, on the ground uh, and can pick up any question you have, uh, both when it comes to Norwegian technology or Norwegian businesses or cooperation uh, possibilities within Norway. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Christiane, and thank you, Ambassador. Um, great presentations, lots of information. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone listening, uh, participating, please send in your questions. Uh, now is the time. Uh, we're, we'll hopefully have about 10 minutes uh, for, for your questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob Pascal with DFO to talk about uh, Canada's blue economy strategy. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, and recognizing we're running a, uh, a little uh, behind, I'll, I'll power through. Uh, 
here. So just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Robert Pascal. I'm the Senior Director of uh, the Blue Economy uh, Strategy Secretariat at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, the Government of Canada is committed to developing a blue economy st uh, strategy, one that is whole of government uh, in nature uh, and uh, the secretariat uh, housed within uh, DFO, but working on behalf of a number of uh, federal departments, including uh, ICED, NRCAN, Transport, uh, Regional Development Agencies, uh, among others. Uh, one of the, the great privileges of going uh, last in, in a series like this is to hear so many of the, uh, the great points made that actually are, are quite in alignment with, uh, with what I was gonna say. So uh, we, we have, a, I think, a good shared understanding of what the blue economy is, and, and Paul made uh, um, really made a lot of excellent points about why uh, a blue economy strategy is necessary from from the perspective of the seafood sector, and, and I think that having uh, this as a a commitment uh, uh, in our minister's mandate letter uh, sort of really uh, has uh, you know borne that out. So. Um, not much need to speak there. Of course, we, uh, when we look at Canada's blue economy strategy, we're looking at a number of, uh, of sectors, including fisheries and, and aquaculture and processing, but uh, really covering a lot of where uh, uh, Kendra uh, had spoken to in terms of what the supercluster is looking at. It's a very broad you know, broad based a number of, of subsectors and, and many sectors that, uh, to be honest, when I started doing this work, didn't even know existed in, in terms of new technology, such as things like uh, seabed carbon capture uh, and storage, you know, new areas where Canadian technology can be brought to bear. So when we talk about Canada's blue economy strategy that's under development, what do we really mean here? We're looking to develop a strategic plan, a high-level high policy framework, something that kind of is akin to a speech uh, from the throne uh, for the oceans, uh, creating clear linkages to a lot of the work that's already been done to date, but helping to guide new federal actions and investments uh, now and into the, uh, into the future. Uh, of course, built on a number of, of, uh, of principles that, and I think, you know, the, these words here will, will, will mirror and echo a number of, again, the, the previous presentations. I think an acknowledgement, and, and while I think obvious to this audience that Canada is an ocean nation, not, that's not always a pervasive thought through all of Canada, and it's something that needs to continually be reinforced, uh, the, the need to ensure that we are taking a holistic, integrative approach to both the economy and the environment, um, that the uh, strategy and the benefits that come from it are uh, inclusive in nature, and a recognition that uh, you know what might work in one part of Canada might not work in another, and so that we'll look at tailored approaches and, and be place-based uh, as we move forward. Um, so from last February to June, uh, under previous Minister uh, Jordan, uh, we move uh, forward with a significant engagement of uh, <clears throat> uh, various stakeholder groups and partners, including uh, Indigenous peoples. Uh, and uh, this in involved more than 40 ministerial roundtables, hundreds of other uh, discussions at the officials level, uh, over 140 written submissions provided uh, uh, to the Secretariat. And a number of clear themes emerged in, in what, you know, what we heard. Uh, again, the need to ensure a, a sustainability uh, kind of is at the core of, of how we look at resource use uh, in terms of going forward. Probably uh, the, the, the single greatest uh, a piece of uh, feedback that we, we received was how important data science and knowledge are in terms of driving the blue economy. I think it's, it, one can sort of see uh, data and information is really that adds sort of the key infrastructure in a way that drives uh, the uh, blue economy going forward. Second, the need for addressing labor gaps to be able to, to sort of seize on any uh, any kind of growth moving forward, but uh, also where we're, we're, we have shortages in, in terms of certain skills. And I think, again, Kendra raised how some of the, the you know, more tech, uh, technology-based, innovation-based uh, skill sets are more and more what's required in order to drive that, that growth forward. Uh, the important role in, in, uh, that the ocean plays uh, with respect to uh, mitigating climate change, the need for decarbonization within industrial sectors are, are, are key pieces. Regulatory modernization, I touched a bit upon that, and, and how we are uh, 
you know, indigenous peoples are really looking to have more opportunity to, to, to see their participation in the uh, blue economy uh, be propelled. Uh, and where Canadian strengths around uh, activities such as combating uh, IU fishing and ghost gear and plastics can be uh, leveraged in a in, uh, more global sense. Um, maybe a bit more specifically uh, with respect to the seafood sector uh, that, uh, you know, the fishing, uh, fishing opportunity, fishing is, is really the backbone of, of much of uh, uh, what the blue economy represents to communities, uh, and that there you know, is continued need to ensure that we're uh, protecting uh, uh, owner-operator-based uh, harvesters, uh, so that benefits stay in coastal communities. The you know, as Tim, a lot of the points mentioned around uh, the benefits of aquaculture and how they could play a significant role in reconciliation, and and, and while there's you know wide-ranging views on on uh, how best to do that in Canada, in various parts of the country, how uh, there's a need for uh, a federal uh, champion, uh, and as, as well that uh, innovation uh, is going to continue to be uh, key in order to keep uh, moving forward Canadian strengths uh, and pushing forward uh, both domestic and international market uh, opportunities. Um, there's a lot more to say, I'm sure, and happy to uh, for the conversation. But hopefully, Tim, uh, that helps save you uh, a few uh, minutes uh, within the discussion today. Excellent, Rob. Thanks so much. That was a great presentation and and uh, really really concise. So thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to questions discussion. Um, I'm going to start. There are a couple of questions. Thank you from our from the viewers. Um, but I'm going to start with a higher level question to uh, the panelists, and maybe you can just take a. Uh, a short period of time to respond if you'd like. My question is, what is holding us back fundamentally in Canada? When we see Iceland, Norway, other countries that are really charging ahead and Canada is kind of stuck. We're flatlining, as I said, in aquaculture on the West Coast in particular, we're actually declining. What, what is Canada's challenge? Can, can the panelists, can I ask you for one or two suggestions of what the key is? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but uh, it would be very helpful to know what 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 is what is really a, a fundamental problem. Paul, one thing, if I it, yeah, if I sum it up, you know, if I can only say one thing, I I think it's a lot of inconsistent uh, policy measures, decisions uh, over time that uh, hold us back and not enable us to invest and really. Um, uh, you know, our our fisheries are. Uh, our exploitation rates are very low compared to, say, Norway or other leading jurisdictions, and uh, we could probably do better. Yeah, maybe to build on that, you know, when we look at Norway in, in particular, so I think something like 80% of the population is on the coast. And by comparison in Canada, we have about 20% of our population that's on the coast. So day to day, our decision makers are, are not thinking about oceans. So we have spent a lot of time, I think to, to um, Robert's point, trying to raise awareness that Canada is an ocean nation. This is a tremendous economic opportunity. It's highly relevant to the climate change conversation. And we just need to continue to raise awareness so that it, we are thinking about these issues and these opportunities at the same level as some of the other sectors that get a lot more attention in Canada. Thanks, great, Kendra. Minister, did I, do you want to take a crack? Well, if I could, I, I agree with uh, Paul and Kendra. And, uh, you know, when you take a look at the regulatory framework and the way it is different between different jurisdictions, that's one of the first things I noticed when I got here. And also, to the realization that over three previous, us being the third administrations, that it was one of taking a look at, all right, how <clears throat> this is happening, how should we do it? And so that awareness and then trying to figure out, OK, how do we move forward? And then we had Dole, he report, and then it was a period of seven years of implementation. And we're just now getting into the first full cycle, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in open uh, pen fishing, fin fish. You know, how, how does that go? And to provide that predictability to industry, to our citizens, and on, although a lot of the population of Canada isn't as dense around the coastline as 
it is in Norway, I believe it is just as dense here in Nova Scotia. You know, we are, we are Canada's ocean playground. So we have that lack of geography and to, to compare, we don't have a normalized industry across Canada. So that is causing some of the delay. If Canada were as concise as Norway, if I can phrase it that way, maybe we would be along the same continuum and, and further along, but we're not. Thanks, Minister. Does anybody else want to take a crack at that? Rob, did I see you? No? Nope. Well, I, I mean, I think what I would add is that, you know, the issues in the ocean space are enormously complex. And, uh, and you know, many different players uh, uh, with with varying objectives and, and the work that's necessary to get to a shared a shared vision uh, is important in order to be able to make that, I think, progress uh, uh, really accelerate from where we are. But we are building off of, uh, and I think we've heard it today, right? That, you know, there are assets that we're working from. We're not sort of starting from scratch. There's a lot that's, that's taken place. And so uh, we have a great base to build off of. It's just, you know, working in coherence, I think that that will help us really accelerate progress. Thanks, that's great. I'm going to open a bit of a can of worms because I've got a comment from uh, someone in the Q&A talking about net pens, favorite, favorite topic of ours. Um, again, huge opportunity for Canada. 97% um, of salmon produced in this country is from uh, farm, farm sources. What I want to ask, though, is to the panelists is what role does science play? How is government doing with science evaluation? Because on the West Coast, for instance, in BC, out of the Cohen Commission, uh, there were basically nine to 10 studies done by DFO, each one establishing through peer-reviewed science review that there was minimal impact on wild salmon from net pen salmon farming. And yet, a huge decision was made by the Minister of Fisheries. She said, not about science, uh, but to basically shut down salmon farms in British Columbia, which has a big impact for the entire country and operations. And my question is, if it's not the regulator who actually decides on science and can, can evaluate that science, who is it? So I, I just like to ask that to panelists. I know it's a, a bit of a touchy issue, but, um, but, but, the, but the regulator and the evaluation of science is so critical for both the wild capture and aquaculture sectors. Anybody want to touch it? Um, I'm going to you go first and I'll go second. Okay, Minister, because uh, I, let's tag team on this one. Sounds good. Um, I think it would be naive for us to think that the science alone is enough to shift the minds of those who feel impacted by this type of fishery. We've talked a little bit about social license and the minister talks about social license a fair bit. And while many of us, particularly those of us that are steeped in this work and understand the science for us who are non-scientific folks, um, you know, as much as we can understand it, I, I think we perhaps um, underestimate the strength of social license and just simple fear and the not in my backyard sentiment um, that oftentimes will, will trump um, the science. And I think that's what we see. Um, so I think it is equal parts science and, and social license. And if I may say, the science of understanding social license and how to gain social license. Um, so I, I'm not going to attempt to, you know, get into the science because I, I quickly learned um, the minimal impact of this kind of farming in our waters and that it is actually quite, um, it, is, it is safe, it's sustainable, it is low impact. That said, um, before I came to this department, I would have been one of those citizens on the other side of, in, in saying, not in my backyard. So it really is, is a combination of really understanding the social license and the approach um, 
to having those conversations. And earlier today, I was talking about this and someone was saying the importance of transparency. And I said, I think it is, it needs to be more than transparency. We can be transparent. Um, what I said was we need to create a vortex, a vortex of truth and information and education that people can get actually pulled into so that they can understand um, how the science impacts their daily lives. Um, and so I, I really think, you know, and I realize that I'm on a kind of a slightly more cerebral level with this, but it is really truly important that we consider the social license and how we approach that and um, not to rely solely on the science because it's proven to be not enough. Thanks, Deputy Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. And I, I, I'd like to also acknowledge that uh, Ronnie in the uh, Q&A, Ronnie and Stuart have both sort of touched on this area as well. It, uh, it takes up a huge amount of my gray matter thinking about this the, uh, and with the department and how we can achieve social license. It's so important in everything we do in the province. And the Premier, too, is uh, uh, when we talk, it's around this. And uh, so it's it's very important that we figure out how to do this. I think I had alluded to earlier that we had we had the uh, two administrations ago, they sort of had the conception of how we might do this. And then the next administration came up with rules and regulations and that to help with social license as well as the regulatory framework around industry. And then now we are in the process of saying, okay, we've done all that. Now, what are, what are the sticky points? What are the touchy points as you alluded to that need to be addressed? And this is one. We've uh, started the regulatory review. Uh, I've tasked uh, Deputy Howe and Chief Terrence Paul as co-chairs of that. And part of this will be huge social engagement, public engagement, and we're hiring a facilitator to do that, to help inform what's going on. In my background, I've come from municipal as well as uh, uh, not-for-profit organizations and very much understand from my experience, the importance of having the public have a say and to not just be heard, but to be understood and that you move forward in a rational way, balancing all kinds of elements around that. So social license is extremely important. The, um, and it, it does. Uh, it spends, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I have a lot of time that I spend with staff in my department saying, we got to get this, we have to do this. And I know that when I stand up in the legislature and later this month, next month rather, I'll be asked questions about that. And uh, I've got phone calls that I'm returning all the time from people looking to address this. And I'm sure Stuart and I'll be meeting in the next couple of weeks for sure. But anyhow, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Minister. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. We are running out of time, everyone. Um, so I'm going to ask Ambassador Fredrickson for uh, sort of a final comment on this, if that's okay. Sorry, Christian, I think we have to cut out in a minute. So, um, Ambassador. Thank you, Tim. Uh, well, I, I actually had a question for, for my Nova Scotia colleagues uh, uh, come, um, uh, regarding to, to the comment by the Deputy Minister that uh, it's not in, not in my backyard uh, effect. Um, so just, just a question, if it's the first time to answer it, uh, if the um, resistance is maybe not the right word, but the, the skepticism towards uh, having agricultural uh, farms uh, actually come from basically from, from local communities, um, uh, or if there are other groups as well that, that are uh, skeptical about this. I mean, in Norway, we see this with, say, uh, offshore uh, wind farms or, or even onshore wind farms, that there can be local resistance. In, as you say, not in my backyard effect. We haven't, I think, seen it to the same degree with, with, with aquaculture, which is basically in the fjords. Um, so, so that was just a question. So, uh, no, I mean real concerns of course that has to be addressed in any community where you are uh investing in 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 uh, new uh types of, of economic activity uh obviously uh as was said both by by my Norwegian colleagues and, and myself um there has been you know uh, it's been a long uh um experience uh, over the last decades in norway there has been a lot of questions asked with with uh, with uh, regard to environmental issues uh, i think that that the um 
successive governments have, have addressed this issue and, and there has been all, uh, you know, the, the regulatory framework has been developed all the time. We didn't talk about that today, but we have the so-called traffic light system along the coast, which uh, is supposed to regulate uh, what areas can be developed or not. Uh, and, and a lot of those uh, issues or, or teasing trouble issues uh, in this industry has been addressed technological as well uh, over the years. Uh, so what I think is that if you have new uh, areas, uh, new communities uh, that could uh, possibly attract this kind of investment, uh, it would not be the same uh, experience to go through for them as for some of those communities in for instance, in Norway, that attracted the first investments uh, or experimented for that sake locally with fish farming uh, if you go back 20 or 30, 40 years. So, uh, I mean, the technology uh, uh, of today, especially if you put up a new plant, uh, is, is uh, very different from, from what we had back then. So maybe, I could be wrong, but maybe uh, there is a sense that some of the debate around this is lagging a little behind the actual technological development. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm going to go uh, quick response, Minister Craig or Deputy, to uh, to that question, and then we're going to have closing remarks. I, I don't really have any more to add, other than uh, Ambassador will be in contact for a visit to Norway and uh, to have a conversation about a lot of this. Thank you, Minister. Well, we are at time. Sorry, Christian, but I, I would like to thank everyone for attending. I'd like to thank the Nova Scotia government for hosting. Um, it's great to have these conversations. I think uh, the more sort of open, honest conversations we have about these issues, the faster and better we can be as a country in producing, uh, you know, an amazing blue economy, but also an amazing seafood sector. So uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks for your time. And, uh, and we hope to see you at the next uh, panel. Bye-bye.